thanks, Dean McIntyre, and thanks, Professor Raghav Cha, uh, for enabling this interaction in this wonderful place, in this absolutely amazing, incredible city. Um, I must say something about uh, having recently retired. Uh, I was, as mentioned by Dean McIntyre, I was briefly in the Indian Parliament in the Upper House in the Rajya Sabha. Uh, and the time came when some of us had completed our term and some, us, some of us were being retained for another term. And the then Prime Minister made this remark. He said that these titles of MPs, PMs, are temporary titles. The only permanent title is ex-MP. Uh, and so I now have the permanent title of an ex-professor at the University of Illinois. Now today I'm speaking about uh, Lincoln and Gandhi. Uh, now of course they were separated by space, by time. Uh, Gandhi was born 60 years uh, after Lincoln. Uh, the two provide a physical contrast as well with Lincoln standing at six foot four, Gandhi at five foot six. Uh, they present contrasting contexts as well. One was the president of a large new nation, the other needed to free an old nation. Yet the two also had obvious similarities. Both were gifted lawyers, neither was thought good looking. Sarojini Naidu, the famous poet in India, called Gandhi Mickey Mouse for his large ears. And Lincoln was laughed at not only for his oversized ears, but also for long arms that apparently swung like a pendulum, for huge hands and even bigger feet, and for a loose, shambling gait. Uh, for a man of his height, Gandhi too had long arms. Both made fun themselves of their looks, with Lincoln once asking when called a double-faced politician whether he would be wearing this face if he had another to put on. <laughs> and both made people around them laugh. Both were shrewd politicians. Both were often assailed by depression. Both had soaked up texts that meant much to their people, including in Lincoln's case, the Bible and Shakespeare, in Gandhi's case, the Gita and the Ramayana. And if a 37-year-old Lincoln once challenged a rival politician in Illinois called James Shields to a duel, uh, which was called off at the last minute, a 55-year-old Gandhi wrote in 1924 in his journal, Young India, quote, I hate dueling, but it has a romantic side to it. <laughs> he added, I would love to engage in a duel with the big brother, Maulana Shaukatari. These were the two brothers that he was in an alliance with at the time. When we, when we are both satisfied that there is no chance of unity without bloodshed and that even we two cannot agree to live in peace, I must then invite the big brother to a duel with me." Unquote. Uh, now the greatest obvious similarity between Lincoln and Gandhi is how they died. Both expected to be killed, both were killed, with both assassinations occurring on a Friday. But there are less obvious similarities too. The first of these is the strong self-belief. Well, before he ran for president, Lincoln felt he had something to offer, quote, on the great and durable question of the age for America, namely slavery. And Gandhi often expressed his awareness that his job was to be lead his people to independence. In both cases, it was more than vanity. Offering himself a re-election in 1864, Lincoln genuinely thought that he could, quote, better serve the nation in its need and peril than any new man, unquote and that he was fitter than the others available to reunite his bitterly divided people. Gandhi told his close colleague and friend Kaka Kalelkar in 1932, interesting uh, phraseology, that like a pregnant woman who takes care of herself for the sake of the baby in her womb, he was looking after his own fitness for the sake of the independence he was carrying inside of him. Uh, Lincoln and Gandhi are similar also in their physical proximity to violence and war. Both abhorred bloodshed, but were fated to witness lots of it. Lincoln was critical of America's 1846-48 war with Mexico, felt that American greed and mendacity had drawn Mexico into that war, and suspected that a desire for new territories for slavery was part of the American motivation. Despite his grasp of the consequences of violence, Lincoln had to preside over what remains America's bloodiest war to date. Despite a passion against violence and over three decades of presenting an alternative to violence, Gandhi could not prevent the killings of 1947, the year of India's and Pakistan's independence, which took half a million lives. Yet we should recall that neither Lincoln nor Gandhi made the non-occurrence of violence his sole goal. 
Lincoln cherished the goal of American unity and Gandhi that of Indian independence. Each desired to achieve his goal without using violence and without violence occurring. And Gandhi on his part even said that he would rather not have independence if violence was the only way of getting it. Also again and again he warned that the weak and the disabled in India would be steamrolled in an India that worshipped violence. But even Gandhi never said that ensuring a violence-free India was his sole goal. That country's freedom was his end and non-violence his sole means. This meant, among other things, that Gandhi refused to be coerced by warnings from British rulers that his campaigns were likely to invite violence. He went to extreme lengths to prevent violence, but did not always suspend his campaigns if violence seemed possible. Sometimes he did, sometimes he did not. Similarly, Lincoln refused to be intimidated by the threat that his positions would cause war. He would do his best to avert war, but something else, the preservation of the American Union, was his paramount aim. In the event, Lincoln and Gandhi, both seen by the world as symbols of reconciliation, sympathy, and justice, spent the final years of their lives amidst great violence. A third similarly largely unnoticed, big about a third similarity, largely unnoticed, lies in the way the two expressed their vision. Gandhi was not the poet or the artist that Lincoln was. While many in our time, including in India, are able to recite Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, I'm sure 90% of you can, Gandhi's utterances or writings have not attracted, even from Indians, a comparable memorization, if we leave out some popular and often inauthentic phrases. For, the, for those, uh, now, I won't read the Gettysburg Address, I, everybody here is aware of it, but I will read a sentence from it. He says in it, the world will little note long, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Of course, the opposite was true. Time has proved Lincoln wrong, and his 270 or so words are remembered more than the deeds that call for them. We may note that the name Gettysburg does not feature in this speech, which cons confines itself to an abstract idea. Neither slavery, nor the Union, nor the South, nor America is mentioned in the Gettysburg Address. While Lincoln's message may be found along with his art in the Gettysburg Address, and in the equally unforgettable second inaugural, Gandhi, when asked to sum up what he stood for, simply said, my life is my message. Like his message, Gandhi's art, too, was expressed in his life. It was reflected in his spinning wheel, in the cotton thread that tied Indian to fellow Indian, in the march to the sea to break the salt law, in the walks in Noah Kali and Bihar to protect the weak. And let us look, nonetheless, at Gandhi's response in 1946, 18 months, up, 18 months before his death, when he was asked to describe the independent India he wished to see. In his, India, in his India, said Gandhi, where in his words, the last is equal to the first, or in other words, that no one is to be the first and none the last. These are Gandhi's words I, I'm quoting, several sentences here. Independence must begin at the bottom. Thus, every village will be a republic, having full powers. In this structure composed of innumerable villages, they will be ever widening, never ascending circles. Life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom. It will be an oceanic circle, whose center will be the individual, always ready to perish for the village, the latter ready to perish for the circle of villages, till at last the whole becomes one life composed of individuals, never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle. Therefore, the outermost circumference will not wield power to crush the inner circle, but will give strength to all within and derive its own strength from it. Continues Gandhi, I may be taunted with the retort that this is all utopian and therefore not worth a single thought. If Euclid's point, though incapable of being drawn by human, by human agency, has an imperishable value, my picture has its own. End of quote. A year later, close to India's independence day, August 1547, someone in Calcutta asked Gandhi for an answer to uncertainty in one's life. What do you do when you are filled with doubt? when you don't know what choice to make. Gandhi's reply is fairly well known. This is what it is. I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt, or when the self becomes too much with you, recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man whom you may have seen, and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. Will he gain anything by it? Will it restore him to a control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj, self-rule, independence for the hungry and spiritually starving millions. Then you will find your doubts and yourself melting away." Unquote. 
Now, in the first of these passages, Gandhi spells out his vision for India even as Lincoln at Gettysburg spelled out his vision for America. Like Lincoln at Gettysburg, Gandhi paints an abstract and universal, if also in his case, a geometric picture. On examination, the two pictures, Lincoln's and Gandhi's, may be found to contain common elements. Taken together, the two passages from Gandhi quoted above underline, rather like Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural, the principle of human equality and the folly in the notion of high and low. President Lincoln used solemn occasions, an inaugural, a State of the Union Address, a dedication of graves, to remind his people that prestige came at a price. Proposing the emancipation of slaves in a State of the Union address on 1 December 1862, he famously said, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. Honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve, we shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Gandhi was never the Indian counterpart of an American president, he was not a prime minister speaking on Independence Day from the ramparts of the Red Fort, but the national stage traveled to Gandhi whenever he went on a fast. And the fasting Gandhi's remarks could be Lincoln-esque. Thus, on 12 January 1948, when Gandhi announced a fast against attacks on minorities in India and Pakistan, and asked for the restoration of security for, Indi for Delhi's threatened Muslims, he also said, the reward will be the regaining of India's dwindling prestige. I flatter myself with the belief that the loss of a soul by India will mean the loss of the hope of the aching, storm-tossed, and hungry world. We remark the similarities with Lincoln's words of December 1862. Now, both were passionate about national unity, but only one of them succeeded in keeping his country united. Lincoln led a victorious, if bitter, and bloody war to undo secession, but Gandhi failed despite a series of efforts to avert India's partition. Before examining this question further, we should mark that where Lincoln faced one deeply divisive issue, namely slavery, Gandhi had to wrestle with two polarizing questions, the Hindu-Muslim relationship and the caste question, the untouchability question. If Lincoln had to ask himself how far or fast he could go against slavery without alienating American whites in general, and later whether he could allow a South resolved on preserving slavery to secede, Gandhi had to ask himself how far or fast he could go to satisfy Muslims who feared unfair treatment from India's Hindu majority and also the quote-unquote untouchables who feared domination by Hindu high castes without alienating the Hindu high castes. Later in the summer of 1947, Gandhi had to ask himself how he should respond to the agreement for independence come division that the political representatives of India's Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs and the still powerful British had arrived at. This agreement stipulated that Muslim majority areas in the northwest and east of the subcontinent should be free to separate. We've already seen that Lincoln's America had been independent for several decades. Gandhi's India was fighting to be free. This movement towards independence brought to the fore the question of who might dominate whom once the British hand was removed. The Hindu, Muslim, and caste polarizations were sharpened as a result of this movement towards independence. India's movement towards independence had a parallel in, in Lincoln's America, the movement of the population towards the West from the East. By creating new states, this migration sharpened America's tension over slavery, an uneasy yet fairly effective North-South compact that slavery would be permitted in but restricted to Southern states had kept a lid on the tension until the 1850s. And the fact that pro-slavery and anti-slavery states had an equal number of votes in the US Senate also helped. But a bitter fight ensued in the 1850s following the possibility of slavery being allowed in the new state of Kansas. If Kansas became a slave state, it would tilt the US Senate as a whole in slavery's favor. The American Constitution of 1787 had permitted slavery clearly, though not explicitly. But this permission was accompanied by a tacit understanding that slavery would gradually wind down. However, slavery's defenders cited its constitutional legality and claimed further that states that had come together to form America had the right to leave the Union if it let them down. Lincoln challenged this view, not only by reminding America of the understanding to end slavery, but also by holding that, quote, the Union was older than the Constitution, unquote. As Lincoln saw it, the Union was formed, in his words, by the Articles of Association of 1774, continued by the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 
pointing to one of the de declared objects for establishing the Constitution, quote, to form a more perfect union, unquote, Lincoln argued that the phrase proved the existence of the Union prior to the Constitution. Rejecting the view that the states had created the federal government, Lincoln held that the earlier text, the Declaration of Independence, was America's founding document. Because America was one, the Union, in Lincoln's view, could legally go to war to end the secession declared by the southern states. And also, and this too was critical, the Declaration of Independence, the founding text, had solemnly stated that all men are created equal, without suggesting that blacks were to be excluded, were to be excluded from, quote, all men, unquote. But it was more than a legal question. Critics and defenders alike have acknowledged Lincoln's passionate attachment to the Union. It has been said that sentiment for the Union in Lincoln rose, quote, to the sublimity of religious mysticism, unquote, and also that the only thing like passion or infatuation in the man was the passion for the Union of these states. As for Gandhi's reasoning against India's division, let me quote what he said in 1939, when he first heard that a separate Muslim homeland was being demanded, backed by a thesis that Muslims and Hindus were, quote, unquote, two nations. Wrote Gandhi in October 1939, why is India not one nation? Was it not one during, say, the Mughal period? Is India composed of two nations? If it is, why only two? Are not Christians a third, the Parsis a fourth, and so on? Are the Muslims of China a nation separate from the other Chinese? Are the Muslims of England a different nation from the other English? This is 1939. How are the Muslims of the Punjab different from the Hindus and the Sikhs? Are they not all Punjabis, drinking the same water, breathing the same air, deriving sustenance from the same soil? Are Muslims all over the world a separate nation? Or are the Muslims of India alone to be a separate nation distinct from the others? It continues Gandhi, a Bengali Muslim speaks the same tongue that a Bengali Hindu does, eats the same food, has the same amusements as his Hindu neighbor. They dress alike. I have often found it difficult to distinguish by outward sign between a Bengali Hindu and a Bengali Muslim. We may note that these remarks were made five months before the Muslim League's Lahore Resolution of March 1940, which demanded what would soon be called Pakistan. Presiding at the Lahore gathering was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, seven years younger than Gandhi, and like Gandhi, a brilliant Gujarati lawyer. Speaking in Bombay on 16 September 1940, Gandhi voiced his opposition to partition in emotional terms. I do not say this as a Hindu. I say this as a representative of Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, and all. I would say to Muslim brethren, cut me to pieces first and then divide India. You are trying to do something which was not attempted even during the Muslim rule of 200 years. We shall not allow you to do it, unquote. Seven years later, however, India was divided. The Hindu-Muslim question, which as we have seen was similar in some though not in all ways to America's North-South divide, was, quote, resolved, unquote, in 1947 through India's partition. Calling the South an alliance of rebels, Lincoln went to war against it, crushed what he saw as rebellion, and the Union was preserved. Despite what India's Hindus and Muslims had in common, Gandhi did not, for all his passion and reasoning, advocate war or compulsion for keeping India one. Nor did he, despite his exclamation of September 1940, which I just quoted, go on a fast to oppose the creation of Pakistan or offer himself to be cut into pieces. In the summer of 1947, Gandhi's position was very different from that of Lincoln when Lincoln faced the South's secession. The administration in New Delhi, led by his closest colleagues, Nehru, Patel, Rajaji, Prasad, had all accepted the partition plan. The League had accepted it. The Akalis, the Sikh party, had accepted it. The British, the, still the ruling power, were in favor of partition. Where Lincoln fought the civil war on behalf of the Union government, Gandhi weighed whether he could lead a rebellion against India's government, against the imperial power, against India's leading political parties, and against his own close colleagues of 30 years. Though the man, close to his 78th birthday, seriously pondered leading a rebellion for unity. In the end, he chose not to. He did not see a critical mass of supporters. India's people did not want a rebellion. At the All India Congress Committee meeting of 14 June, convened to ratify the partition plan, this is what Gandhi said. You have a perfect right to revolt. He was addressing some who were critical of the agreement on partition. You have a perfect right to revolt, but I do not find that strength today. If you had it, I would also be with you. If I felt strong enough myself, I would alone take up the flag of revolt. But today, I do not see the conditions for doing so." Unquote. The legal conditions were not there. There was a pact for separation, not for a union. 
The political conditions were not there. All the leading parties were in favor of partition. All he had was his emotional attachment for one India. He did not think it reason enough. Gandhi resigned himself to partition. Quote, when the popular view is contrary to mine, should I force my own view on the people? I must step aside and stay back, he said on 9 June 1947. It was not Gandhian nonviolence that came in the way of a nation or a people keen on preventing or reversing partition. At independence in August 47, the Indian government led by Gandhi's close colleagues, Nehru and Patel, had neither the will nor a popular mandate nor the military force to attempt anything like the, an undoing of Pakistan. In fact, no mainstream element in India defied the division. Moreover, India did not have a founding document like the Declaration of Independence that legally entitled the Indian Union to undo Pakistan. Though the Indian National Congress, of which Gandhi was for many years the unquestioned leader, and which was supported by the bulk of India's Hindus, and the Muslim League, the leading political body of the Muslims, had forged short-term alliances during the course of the independence movement in 1916, for instance, and again from 1920 to 1922, the two bodies had never signed on to an agreed declaration or constitution. On his part, Gandhi had worked repeatedly for such an agreement. In September 1944, he and Jinnah talked 14 times to find an accord, with Gandhi proposing complete autonomy for Muslim-majority areas after independence, if the Muslim League worked jointly with the Indian National Congress to end British rule, but Jinnah rejected the offer. Then in April 1947, Gandhi proposed to his Congress colleagues and to Lord Mountbatten, India's last British Viceroy, the installation of an All India government led by Jinnah as an alternative to partition. But his colleagues and the British Viceroy successfully joined forces to defeat Gandhi's plan, which was never put to Jinnah. By the way, uh, one of the chief uh, uh, elements in this successful effort to uh, scotch Gandhi's plan uh, was a very prominent Indian civil servant called VP Menon, who was then senior uh, functionary under the Viceroy. And VP Menon, who later was very prominent in India's administration, wrote a paper called Tactics to be Adopted uh, uh, Against uh, Gandhi's Plan. And it's a, it's a paper in the transfer of power volumes. Um, as to why Gandhi did not go on a fast to death to prevent partition, perhaps he was influenced by the possibility that a fast by him or his death from a fast would bring about not any rethinking of, over partition, but a fresh cycle of Hindu-Muslim killings. To die to prove that I alone was right was meaningless, Gandhi said on 5 June. When partition seemed inevitable, but, but was heralded by terrible Hindu-Muslim violence, reconciliation between Hindus and Muslims rather than the prevention of Pakistan became Gandhi's chief goal. In this task, his action and words were again Lincoln-esque. Now, let me quote some lines from Lincoln's second inaugural, delivered in March 1865, when the Union was approaching victory in the Civil War. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, both read the same Bible, and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. 82 years later, Gandhi in India also spoke of the unity of God. 13 June 1947. When God is here, there and everywhere, God must be one. That is why I ask whether those calling God Rahim would have to leave India, and whether in the part described as Pakistan, Rama as the name of God would be forbidden. Would someone who called God Krishna be turned out of Pakistan? We shall worship God both as Krishna and Kareem, and show the world that we refuse to go mad. In line with Gandhi's convictions, India adopted a constitution that rejected the idea of a Hindu India abutting a Muslim Pakistan. Though the new India was smaller than what Gandhi had imagined, it was an India for all its inhabitants. If Lincoln preserved the Union, Gandhi also preserved a, quote, Union of India, unquote, which is India's full and correct name, assuring equal rights to all in its truncated space. Now, I have another uh, portion on untouchability. I'll, I'll deal with it quickly, because I think we should have enough time for, for questions. Um, 
Now we all we know that Lincoln, despite uh, his battle against slavery and his battle for the Union, his battle against the secessionist South, has often been criticized for not being an abolitionist and also being not uh, passionate enough uh, or, or rapid enough in his fight against slavery. Similarly, um, Gandhi has been criticized by many uh, Dalit leaders, led by uh, the remarkable B. R. Ambedkar in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, that he was also not uh, strong enough in his fight against or fight for the, uh, the so-called untouchables. Uh, but let's look at one of the things here. In September 1932, 15 years before independence, leading Hindu politicians solemnly pledged that Free India's parliament would ban and punish untouchability. The pledge was a direct result of a fast over untouchability by Gandhi, who wanted such a law to be the first act of the independent parliament of India. The abolition of untouchability and punishment for those who practice it would be the, should be the first law of independent India. This was Gandhi's demand, and the leading Indian politicians pledged themselves to it in September 1932, 15 years before independence. In November 49, when the Constituent Assembly passed Article 17 of the Indian Constitution, uh, and uh, by the time Gandhi was dead, de declaring that untouchability was abolished and that its practice in any form was forbidden and punishable, members remarked that the soul of Gandhi, who had been assassinated 21 months earlier, had finally been given satisfaction. Today, criticisms of Gandhi, originally made by Ambedkar, the brilliant and dedicated Dalit, who was Gandhi's political opponent for many years, are frequently voiced. Ambedkar, modern India's most popular Dalit icon, complained that the abolition of untouchability was not Gandhi's sole aim, and that Gandhi's aims of independence and Hindu-Muslim unity, no matter how worthy, diluted the fight against untouchability. In fact, said Ambedkar, independence was risky for Dalits, for it would give high caste Hindus political power on top of the social power they already enjoyed. Another of Ambedkar's charges uh, was that though Gandhi attacked untouchability, he did not attack the caste system or Hinduism, which had tolerated, if not blessed, the evil of untouchability. I think many are aware of Lincoln's sharing some of the popular prejudices of his time, some of his remarks about the African-Americans at the time are well known, and uh, they do disclose uh, a great deal of, 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 of ignorance and even prejudice. Uh, Neither Gandhi nor Lincoln, were they alive in my assessment, would dispute proofs of their preconceptions and their limitations. And perhaps neither should be judged on, from the perspectives of later and better informed times. Now, Gandhi believed that untouchability would really end only when the minds of caste Hindus were changed. Neither the British government, the continuance of which Ambedkar favored, nor a dictator Gandhi. Now, Ambedkar once said to Gandhi, you are very popular among the Hindus, and you share some very good views on the question of caste and untouchability. But I want you to give up your fight on, against indep for independence and on the Hindu-Muslim question. Just appoint yourself a dictator of the Hindus and focus only on this very important question. And Gandhi said, no, I'm not able to do this. Gandhi believed that untouchability would end only when the minds of caste Hindus would change. Neither the British government, the continuance of which Ambedkar favored, nor a dictator Gandhi would compel caste Hindus to change. They had to be won over, challenged, and shamed. Similarly, Lincoln was aware that for slavery to end, America's whites had to be won over, challenged, and if need be shamed. This meant that Gandhi moved against slave, sorry, this meant that Lincoln moved against slavery gradually and in stages. In 1850, he went along with the so-called fugitive slave law that required all US citizens, including those living in the North, to assist in the capture of runaway slaves in return for a commitment that slavery would not be extended to newly acquired California, though it would be allowed in newly acquired Texas. Four years later, however, Lincoln sharply opposed an act that left scope for an extension of slavery to two new territories emerging from recent expansion, Kansas and Nebraska. In 1861, he went to war, and in 1863, he emancipated slaves in the rebelling South. There were similar stages in Gandhi's battles over caste and untouchability. While attacking untouchability in the sharpest language possible, Gandhi held for several years that India, India's caste system as such, in an idealized form and freed from any marks of high and low, was defensible, while always saying that in the same breath that the idealized form could never be actualized. 
Gandhi felt he had to make a gesture like this to the caste Hindus whom he needed for all his three goals, independence, Hindu-Muslim unity, removal of unmissibility. And it is a fact that for 30 years, <coughs> the vast majority of India's caste Hindus and Dalits followed Gandhi's lead. With time, Gandhi radicalized his position over caste and the caste system. In a 1935 article, 13 years before his death, he declared in capital letters that caste has to go. And about three years before his death, Gandhi said he would give special blessings to marriages or to only those marriages where one party was a Dalit and the other was a caste Hindu. In the end, Gandhi was for intermarriage between caste Hindus and Dalits. In the end, Lincoln was not for intermarriage between whites and blacks, but then Lincoln was born 60 years before Gandhi. Uh, now we know that towards the end, Lincoln uttered these very powerful words in the state of uh, in Second World War. Yet if God wills that the war continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. These searing words, identifying a nation's sin, had finally burst out of one who had often denied voice to his own sense of iniquity, and who by this time had seen much blood drawn. Gandhi was as strong in his emotion against untouchability, and in his case, he voiced his feelings all the time. In 1916, within a year of his return to India for, after spending 20 years in South Africa, a 47-year-old Gandhi said, every affliction that we labor under in this sacred land is a fit and proper punishment for this great and indelible crime that we are committing. In 1921, Gandhi spoke of the Indian fight against the excesses of British rule in India and added, what crimes for which we condemn the government as satanic have we not been guilty of towards our untouchable brethren? We make them crawl on their bellies, we have made them rub their noses on the ground, with eyes red with rage, we push them out of railway compartments, what more than this has British rule ever done? In 24, referring to untouchability, Gandhi said, God does not punish directly, his ways are inscrutable. Who knows that all our woes are not due to that one black sin. Whether or not we agree with Lincoln's strategy and tactics over slavery, or Gandhi's over untouchability, we can acknowledge their role in changing the thinking of the nations. Incidentally, it's worth noting that at Gandhi's suggestion, Nehru and Patel invited Ambedkar to join the Indian cabinet. Not only did Ambedkar agree, he chaired the committee that drafted India's constitution and as India's law minister piloted the passage of the constitution, the untouchable became India's principal lawmaker. Final remarks. What explains the Lincoln-Gandhi similarity across the boundaries of time, space, and culture? Soon after he started Indian opinion in South Africa, a Gandhi in his early 30s and wishing to inspire the journal's readers, wrote a few so short sketches of individuals who had surmounted great odds. One was about Lincoln. Underlining Lincoln's courage on behalf of his country's blacks, Gandhi wrote, it is believed that the greatest and the noblest man of the last century was Abraham Lincoln, unquote. He also spoke of Lincoln's incredible fight when everybody was against his fight. However, there's no evidence to suggest that, Link that Gandhi made a conscious decision to emulate Lincoln's approach, or even that he studied Lincoln's life in great detail. Still, his mind had underlined Lincoln's willingness to confront the toughest challenges for America with what was deepest inside of him. This quality in Lincoln found both response and resonance in Gandhi's soul. He too was prepared to pit his deepest against the toughest, his deepest and his shrewdest. The inmost convictions of both included a certainty that all human beings had equal worth and that one person's domination over another was a sin. Each wished to win all components of his diverse nation. We've seen, moreover, that there was a similarity between race in America and caste in India, and also that both Lincoln's America and Gandhi's India faced a separatist challenge. Given all this, their resemblance in approach and articulation becomes understandable. Almost a century after the Civil War, a 30-year-old man called Martin Luther King Jr. talked of Gandhi and Lincoln in the same breath. Said King in Montgomery, Alabama on 22 March 1959, they killed him, this man who had galvanized 400 million Indians for independence. One of his own fellow Hindus felt that he was a little too favorable towards the Muslims. He was a man of love, falling at the hands of a man with hate, but the man who shot Gandhi only shot him into the hearts of humanity, just as when Abraham Lincoln was shot, Mark Hugh, for the same reason that Gandhi was shot, 
that is the attempt to heal the wounds of a divided nation, and Secretary Stanton said, now Lincoln belongs to the ages. Of course, a little later, Martin Luther King also was shot for similar reasons. Thank you very much.